Welcome to the technological companion for our video lesson titled Using Maximum Likelihood Estimation to Calibrate a Discrete Time Markov Model. Markov models related to McAuliffe's paper on vegetation succession in desert plant communities have appeared in a few of our past technological companions and video lessons now. We began by just seeing how to define a Markov model and how to use it to make predictions about equilibrium states. And then later on, we moved on to how to make predictions about actual time series of what the dominant state in a patch of land would be in terms of the dominant vegetation um, at discrete points in time. One of the biggest problems with modeling a physical system with a discrete time Markov model is to have a way of estimating the transition probabilities in the transition matrix. That's going to be the goal of this technological companion. We'll look at a MATLAB live script that takes realistic time series data that we could imagine could be modeled by a discrete time Markov model and we see how to extract a best fit set of transition probabilities from that time series data. Our goal with this MATLAB live script will be to observe time series data from a system that we believe can be accurately modeled with a discrete time Markov model. However, rather than collect data from a physical system, we're just going to simulate it by establishing a valid Markov transition matrix. It's actually going to be the transition matrix that we attempt to estimate. And then we'll simulate a time series. We'll use that transition matrix to simulate a time series that represents observations that we'd make of the dominant vegetation category in a landscape over time had we actually decided to collect physical data. So this example that we're looking at now calls back to the ongoing example we've been working with that is related to McAuliffe's paper on vegetation succession in, in the simple desert plant community. So to accomplish this task, we begin by defining our transition matrix as an array. And it's the same transition matrix that we've used in the last couple of Markov examples where the columns sum to one. Each column represents the probability distribution for if you begin in state one, column one says if you begin in state one, what are the probabilities of transitioning to state one, two, or three? And then so on. Column two assumes that you begin in state two, column three assumes that you begin in state three. And then just for convenience, we'll calculate the number of states in this system, and we do that by calculating the number of, of columns in, in the Markov transition matrix with the size command, and we store that, that number of states in the variable n. Now we're going to generate a time series that makes 50 steps from an initial value. We randomly choose our initial value just to be any one of the three possible states in our system. And then just like we did in the last Markov example, we create a time series by randomly sampling from the appropriate probability distribution from the appropriate column, depending on what state uh, our, our system is currently in. And then that's going to give us a new state that we append to an array of states so that after 50 steps, we'll have an array of 51 state values showing the historical record of which plant category dominated the landscape at each time step. So that gets us to the point where we have effectively collected data. Again, we're just simulating it, but that's what our data would look like if we had gone out and collected it. To begin analyzing that data, what we really want to know is the number of transitions from one state to the next. 
In other words, I want to know the number of times I started in state one and made a transition to state one, so I stayed the same. Number of times in the time series that I started in state one and made a transition to state two, and then number of times that I started in state one and made a transition to state three. And then I, I want to know that for all of the other pos possible starting states. And I'm going to count that information using some kind of clever internal uh, commands in, in, in MATLAB. I'm not really going to go into how this implementation works in MATLAB. It's, it's, it's not that important. This is something for a short time series. You could certainly just count these by hand. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to store that data. I'm going to store those transition counts in a matrix called n. So the entry in the first row of the first column is going to represent the number of times we made a transition from state one to state one. The second row of the first column is going to represent the number of times we made a transition from state two, or to state two from state one. Third row of the first column will represent the number of times we've observed a transition to state three from state one. And then the remaining columns count the number of transitions from state two, if you are in column two, and state three, if you're talking about column three. And so this is just a kind of a quick one line uh, bit of code that accomplishes all of that and creates the matrix for you. So let's run that block and see what these results look like. All right, we can see that we've, um, Looks like we've run everything. Um, so, no, oh, no, we haven't. Uh, so we've just run the first block and we can see that we've created our transition matrix that's stored over here. We've counted our number of states, there's three of them. And we've got this, this matrix in, that's the important thing that counts the transitions. Let's take a look at that. So this shows us that there have been 10 observations of times where we started in state one and stayed in state one. One time where we started in state one and transitioned to state two. Two times where we started in state one and transitioned to state three. We only started in state two and transitioned to state one once. We only started in state two and stayed there three times. And we only started in state two and transitioned to state three once. Finally, we only started in state three and transitioned to state one two times, started in state three, transitioned to state two once, and started in state three and stayed there 29 times. So that's the number of transit, that, that's the summary of all of our transition counts from our time series. And if we wanted to, you know, imagine how that would look, we would just have to look at our time series and you know, for instance, three to three, that's an instance of state, starting in state three and transitioning to state three. So that is one of the 29 times that happened. So as I said, you could go through such a short time series and count those transitions by hand if you absolutely had to, but this is one fairly elegant one line of code that does it automatically for us. So now why do we need these transition probabilities? If you've worked through the chapter on calibrating a Markov model, or if you've worked through the video lesson that this is a technological companion to, then you'll know that if you form a new matrix where you divide each column of our N matrix by its corresponding column sum, then that is going to be the maximum likelihood estimator for the transition probabilities. So I'm gonna do that, that computation right here. So if I apply sum to a matrix in MATLAB, that calculates the sum of each columns and each of the columns and places those results, three results in this case, in a row vector. And then if I take a, an appropriately sized array, like in three by three array n, and dot divide it by that vector that's got three rows and one or three 
columns in one row to it, then it will automatically divide each column of n by each entry of the sum of n. The values that I get by running this block of code should be reasonably close to these values up here in m. And in order to assess how close, I'm going to subtract m from p and just see how close the entries of the resulting matrix are to zero. So let's run that block of code. So here's our approximation to m. Here's the true values we're shooting for. You know, they're not bad. They're in this, that first column is in the correct ballpark. 0.25 versus 0 0.2, 0 0.63 versus 0 0.6, 0 0.12 versus 0.2, you know, not terrible. Okay, uh, 0 0.11 is the true value. 0 0.0625 is a little small, but same ballpark. 0 0.0312 versus 0 0.04, and 0 0.9 something versus 0 0.85. And the third column's not bad either. They're not super accurate, but for only 50 steps through a time series, which is not a lot of data, it's not a bad approximation. So when, when I look at the absolute differences, we see that these values are all small. So these, this matrix P minus M just represents the difference between the approximate transition probabilities and the correct ones that we've stored in M. So how could we do better? The answer to that is generally get some more data. And so we can certainly, we can certainly improve our accuracy of our estimation for the transition matrix by just going out and collecting more data. Well, one way to do this would just be to go out and observe a longer time series. And so I could create a time series of 2,500 steps instead of 50. And all I would have to do is change my steps parameter to 2,500 instead of 50 reinitialize the, uh, the first state in my time series and then run my loop to generate a new time series. Then I go through and count the different types of transitions and put them in the transition count matrix N using the same single line of code. And then I calculate my maximum likelihood estimator for the transition probabilities by taking N and dividing each column by the column sums. We'll see if this, this improves things. Well, so the only thing we've done is increase the steps to 2,500. So if we run that section, now we'll run the code that computes our tr approximate transition matrix. And we can see that the values are much closer to being correct because these absolute differences between our approximate transition matrix P and our true transition matrix of M much smaller. In fact, right now you can see M is in the tooltip box on our screen. Those are the true values we're shooting for. And if we compare those to P, they're awfully close. They're much closer than they were when we only had 50 steps. But they're not, you know, they're not more than a few decimal places of, of accuracy that we've, we've, we've achieved here. So it's, it's not a great gain. For, for such a large increase in length of our time series. And while it's good that we've made an improvement in our accuracy, we do have to step back and ask ourselves, is, is this really the best way to go? See what I mean by that? Let's think about another way that we could have done this. In particular, let's think about what we've done in the context of the specific application that we're trying to, to um, apply this Markov transition matrix calibration technique to. So in the case of observing the dominant vegetation category in a landscape on an annual basis, it's completely impractical to do what we just did, to collect a single data point for the time series once each year for 2,500 years. Nobody's going to do that. It's probably even impractical to collect a single data point once a year for 50 years. People are just going to lose interest in a study that takes that long. However, it could be feasible to get the same scale of data, the same amount of data, if we were to distribute 500 independent sites across our landscape. 
and make an observation at each of them in parallel once every five years. So this would result in 500 independent time series that are each just five steps long. That's still equivalent to a time series of 2,500 elements. These five time series could be used to produce transition counts, which in turn would be pooled, so we would just add them all together to approximate a transition probability matrix. And so our approach for doing that is, is given in the block of code here below. So we're going to introduce a new variable, sites, that indicates that there's 500 sites. And then steps for reducing, remember that started at 50, we increased it to 2,500, and now we've reduced it down to 5. So then we're going to simulate a time series of observed Markov states, but we're going to do this at each of the sites. So instead of a single time series, we're going to have 500 time series, and each of those are just 5 units long. And in order to make that work, I'm going to create my TS initial state. So TS was my time series. I'm going to create an initial state of that a little bit differently than I had in the past. In the past, I just randomly selected an integer from the set 1, 2, and 3. And that was my initial state for the single time series that I was trying to generate, trying to simulate. Well, now I'm going to create a column vector of random values, each taken from 1, 2, or 3. And that column vector is going to represent the initial state. It's going to have 500 elements in it, and it's going to represent the initial state that is observed in each of the 500 sites. Now, again, this is something in practice that you would just measure. You'd go out to your 500 sites and determine if it was shrubs, grasses, or bare land that dominated the, 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 that site, and you would write down the corresponding number in, in this vector. Now, once I've, I've initialized TS to be this column vector of initial states, then I'm just going to, in a vector format, I'm going to apply the same algorithm to sampling from the Markov columns, Markov transition matrix columns, in order to produce a new state at the next time step, just five times. But I'm going to do it in parallel for each of those initial states. So this big loop here, after it runs once, it's going to add a new column onto TS that represents the new state at each of the different sites. And I'll do that five times so that I will end up ultimately having a data set that looks like a big matrix. It's going to have 500 rows and six columns when it, when it runs. So that, that, that's a little bit complex to wrap your mind around what the code does, but let's just run it and see what the output looks like. In fact, we can see that TS has 500 rows, six columns. Okay, so now that I've done that, I'm going to go through and count my transition, um, or, or find my transition counts. Essentially, do it the same way that I did before, except now I'm I'm applying it to the rather than a single time series, I'm I'm applying it to all of them. So we'll run that block of code, and n gets updated. We'll see what it looks like. We can see that it produces a transition matrix approximation that is, let's get the tool tip. again, once again, reasonably close to M. But the big benefit is that even though we had to approach this problem with a little bit more complexity in terms of code in our analysis, it gives us a reasonably decent approximation to N with only five years worth of observations, as opposed to 50, or even worse, 2,500. And the cost of this is just space. So we're trading time for space. So we're having to go out to a big enough of a study site to allow us to establish 
500 stations where we're going to make observations over this five-year period. But if we're able to do that, that's far better than trying to make 2,500 observations over a 2,500-year period. It's just not feasible. That's pretty much how we're going to implement our maximum likelihood estimation technique for calibrating a Markov chain from data. And the nice thing about this is that, you know, once you've seen something like this, you can reuse it. If you were to go to the beginning of this script, and suppose you had a four-state system, or even a 90-state system, all you'd have to do is enter in the Markov transition matrix, the theoretical one that you're trying to, to approximate, and this code would still run because it's completely parameterized. In fact, you could skip the parts where we're generating our time series, such as this, and just go to an actual measured time series and count the transitions by hand, however you need to do it. If you can create a matrix in, even if you have to hard code it in, that contains your transition counts, then all you really need to do in order to calibrate your Markov transition matrix in order to find what your estimated value for M is, is run that line of code that's highlighted right there. So most of the complexity that was in this example is complexity that's there to generate realistic Markov time series that we can show that our analysis works on. But if you're doing this in practice and you're actually just going out and collecting data, none of these loops or things like that are necessary. You just need to have a way of finding the transition counts within your time series. And you know, a line of code like this would, would do that for you if you wanted to automate it. And if you didn't, you could certainly count the transitions by hand and tabulate them into a transition matrix by hand. Well, that brings us to the end of this technological companion. Thank you for watching, and I hope you found it helpful, and I also hope you'll join us for our next video lesson.